Our next speakers are Dr. Stephen Galswardi and Ernie Durdevich of QB. They will describe how QB uses MLflow for their ML projects, including for model development, model management, and model ops. Please welcome Stephen and Ernie from QB. Hi, thanks for joining us for our talk. Today we're going to be talking about reducing energy waste in homes using a combination of IoT analytics and machine learning. I'm Stephen uh, from QB. I'll be joined later on by my colleague Ernie, and we're going to be concentrating on automating our end-to-end -end workflows uh, with a particular focus on sharing some tips we've come across, as well as uh, explaining how we use ML Flow and, in particular, model registry. So, to start off, uh, I want to share a little bit about uh, QB. So, QB, we're a tech company that's based in Amsterdam. Uh, we believe in a world where living without natural, uh, wasting natural resources is easy. We have been focusing on this uh, since around about 2004, and we concentrate in the areas of energy insight and control for residential buildings. The scale of the, the problem we're dealing with is that households uh, use the, the, a large amount of both electricity and gas uh, across the, the EU and across the world in, in general. The question we really ask ourselves here is how much of this is just wasted? So at QB, we're, we're not here to tell people how much to consume, but to make sure that all their use is intended for the purpose that they, they really want to use that energy for. How do we do that? So, so we have a, a number of technology solutions. Uh, in the sense, you can see how our smart thermostat and an energy display, as well as a number of, of app solutions. We are partnering up with some of the, the largest uh, utilities uh, across Europe. So we work with uh, electricity and gas retailers, as well as insurance companies and water utilities. To give you a little bit of a flavor of our, our technology stack, uh, we're creating a lot, uh, collecting a large amount of IoT and customer data. So this can be electricity meter um, signals coming in at every 10 second resolution, um, water data, data from the, the heating system within the home, as well as user interaction data, profile information, data that the, the user is willing to, to share with us. We store all of that uh, naturally in the cloud. We work with AWS as our provider. Then we offer a number of machine learning um, algorithms on top of that data. Uh, that's where we're working with Databricks and particularly using MLflow. On top of that, we offer a number of personalized services. This is in the areas of advice and insights, control of the, the smart thermostat, and home monitoring services in, in general. To dive a little bit more into the details of that, I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Ernie, and he will take you through. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, let's dive into our unified, unified data analytics setup. So it all starts with the IoT data stream that comes in. Uh, and this is composed of more than a terabyte of data per day. So we store this into Delta Lake, Delta Lake on top of AWS uh, S3. And over the time we have added other data sources. So uh, SQL data and click data streams that comes also in our uh, Delta Lake. So on top of this more than three petabytes of data, we run our batch processing. So the batch processing takes uh, part of the data that is in the Delta Lake, uh, extracts it, runs some transformation and stores it back. And this process is iterated several times until we refine the data with a point that can be served to the user. Um, this uh, batch processing pipeline is composed of uh, more than 60 uh, ETLs so some of these ETLs are simple data filtering or transformations. Uh, some of them contain some machine learning models that are applied on top of the uh, whole data set. Uh, and some uh, contain a lot of machine learning models that are trained for each individual customer. So uh, for instance, we run daily uh, more than a million unsupervised models that are retrained uh, on all customers uh, for the past 90 days. So in this way, uh, we iterate through the process until we get data that we can serve to the customer through our services API. 
so the services API needs to provide data fast with a um, queryable uh, data source. So this is why services API are responsible to store data in their own SQL or NoSQL database in order to have a lower latency. So let's uh, dig a little bit deeper into how a uh, batch processing pipeline looks like. So this is an example you can see on the left. Uh, we have the, the source data, which is the IoT data that we collect. Uh, we run some pre-processing and we store it back again to Delta Lake. And from there on, we extract the different signals like electricity and water from uh, this collection of data and we store it back into Delta Lake. And then we maybe run some algorithms by combining multiple sources and we store it back and this cycle continues until the data is ready. Uh, so every uh, transformation in, in this chart has the same uh, structure. So it has some data that comes in, which can be one or more data sets, and have uh, a data set that comes out. So this is perfect for, for unit testing. Let me show you an example. So here I defined uh, a data schema with two simple columns, an ID and a value, and then define the transformation on top of uh, a data set that has that schema. So you can see the transform method um, accepts an input data set and returns uh, a data set with the same schema in this example, but it can also be a different schema. So a unit test would look like this. Uh, we define the input with a sequence of, um, of, the, of data that we need uh, to test our functionality and we convert this into a data set. And then uh, we create the expectation, so the expected uh, sequence of what we would expect as a result, but we don't need to convert it into a data set because we don't need Spark for checking that the output is correct. Um, and then we run the transformation by passing the input and we trigger the collect statement. So the collect will execute all the transformation uh, that are defined uh, and return uh, a, a collection uh, back. And then we, com uh, we compare this result collection with uh, the expected collection uh, by comparing its length and uh, the distinct values that are in both uh, data sets. So this because Spark doesn't guarantee the ordering uh, of the data set and in order to prevent uh, having missed uh, matches, we, we just cast to a set and we compare element by, and that will compare element by element. Uh, so since Spark tests are uh, generally pretty slow, uh, we hear some tips to, to make them faster. So we reduced, uh, for instance, the uh, Spark SQL shuffle partitions from a default of 200 to four, which is more than enough in a unit test, but uh, of course, don't do this in production. Um, and also we enable the parallel execution of the unit test. So this uh, speeded up in our case for more than two times uh, the unit test. Um, so as you ha have seen, we have some transformations, data in, data out, and they work on batch. Uh, but most of them uh, can also work on streaming. Uh, so it really depends on how the transformation is defined, but uh, most of the time it can just be mapped one-to-one -one with the same code and be run on the stream. Um, most of the uh, transformation work like select, filter, with column, group by uh, the join, uh, user-defined functions, and also the uh, time-based windows that use the group by statements. They all work uh, in batch and streaming, but uh, streaming doesn't support, unfortunately, the non-time-based windows, like the functions uh, lead, lag, first, uh, or last in, um, uh, in your data set. So you have this type of, uh, uh, of functions, then um, uh, it won't work on, on the streaming. Uh, they work only on batch. But there is also, uh, usually there, are, there is also ways to rewrite uh, these algorithms into a group by segment using uh, time-based windows if you use uh, time series data. But this, uh, this creates a bit different paradigm uh, of, of uh, handling the data. 
So it depends on the case. So going back to uh, our unified data analytics setup, we have seen how we run the batch processes, but we also run uh, R&D notebooks. Uh, so data scientists query the same data that uh, is used by the uh, staging or production uh, jobs, uh, and they can execute uh, the data science notebooks and train data, create feature data sets. Uh, and when they are satisfied, uh, no, actually the, when they train their models, we, they log their, um, uh, the performance of the models uh, and the training uh, instance itself into MLflow. So MLflow at the moment contains more than 500 models that we have logged over time. Uh, and this, uh, and when we are satisfied enough with the model, we store it into the model registry. So MLflow model registry helps us providing the models to the batch processing uh, that is happening in production. And at the moment we have uh, more than 15 uh, deployments struck, for instance. And then on top of that, like we also run real-time services and live dashboards to complete our stack of the uh, batch streaming R&D uh, on top of the same data along with the model deployment. So uh, there are three crucial uh, aspects that were simplified when we, uh, when we applied MLflow and uh, MLflow model registry to our use case. So first of all, it became easier to choose the right model uh, between different trainings. Uh, second, it is easier to find what is the model that is running in production or the la latest one that has been developed. And third, um, it's easier to uh, manage the deployment cycle of the models. Uh, let's see some examples. So we, we believe that the source code uh, of the model is not just the code, uh, but it is the combination of code, configuration, and data. So how did we uh, bundle them together before? Uh, we used notebooks, and we used a different notebook for a different combination of input data, code, um, and so on. So choosing the right model was uh, pretty hard because you will have to go into these notebooks and check the uh, metrics and compare them or remember which one was the best one. So with MLflow, uh, this is a bit easier now because we can see a list of all the training instances with relative parameters that were used for the training. Um, the metrics that we measured uh, of the per performance of these metrics uh, and uh, some custom tags that we can add ourselves. And then uh, it's also easier to find, uh, find the latest model because previously we used to go to the data scientists that, uh, that trained the model and ask them where is the notebook uh, they used to train, to train it. Uh, but now we have a unified interface uh, with the MLflow model registry uh, that we can use to see exactly what is the version of the model that is deployed on, on which stage and also click through and, um, and see the code and the data that was used um, at training time. And third, um, we changed our deployment um, of the models. So in, in this case, uh, how we used to do it, we used to create a deployment bundle. And this bundle would contain the artifacts of the code uh, from our repository would contain the job definition, the scheduling, configuration, so everything that was needed to, uh, to run this job. And it would also con um, contain as part of the configuration, the model path, uh, which was stored uh, on S3. So this whole uh, deployment bundle uh, would contain all the information needed for a specific cluster to run its job. So if this uh, bundle was deployed on production uh, cluster, then the production cluster would know how to get the model from S3, given the configuration. But with the MLflow, we don't store this information in the deployment bundle anymore, but we let MLflow model registry uh, decide which is the right model for each environment. So the production cluster will just uh, request the production model, the staging cluster will request 
the staging model and MLflow would be responsible of selecting the uh, cor correct one. And with this, I would like to give the word back to Stephen for a closing note. Um, yeah, so as, as Zenny's just mentioned, I think there's three areas where uh, really MLflow has been giving a huge impact to QB. Um, what has that ultimately resulted in? Uh, the first thing is really data science is getting more impact across the entire organization. So MLflow in combination with the, the other tooling that we use is allowing data scientists, engineers, and analysts working across different product teams to collaborate and reuse models. The way we work at QB is we work in a, a system, what we call a, a value stream, where we're actually having a, a product team that is formed of multiple different disciplines. So covering everything from uh, development, data science and engineering, all the way through to product marketing and user experience. Being able to spread our data capabilities across the, the organization has really allowed us to develop many more products uh, based on data and to get those in the hands of our end users. Uh, another key thing is uh, MLflow facilitates a more uniform way of working. So as Ernie uh, showed uh, previously, there was uh, many different ways of uh, generating models and managing model performance. MLflow offers a more uniform way of, of logging the metrics associated with models uh, and tracking that model performance, as well as being able to make a direct link back to the, the data that a model has been trained and tested on. Overall, this means there's, there's less time spent on infrastructure. And from my perspective, as the, the chief data officer uh, of QB, that means the data team are adding more value, that they're not having to spend a lot of their time just managing the infrastructure. They can really be working within those product teams uh, and contributing towards development. What we also see is development cycles are, are quicker, uh, whereas previously um, work that had been done in, in, in the past uh, particularly on uh, ML model development was was largely hidden. We, we can see it's a, it's a lot quicker to pick up things, uh, proof of concepts that were developed a, a number of months ago and really rapidly bring that um, up and be able to use that to increase the development cycle. Overall, um, ML flow plus uh, a lot of the whole ML ops way of working is helping to power QB's transformation into an AI first company. So you'll see this, this happy bunch of, of people are, all, are very much uh, passionate of, about what they do. But ultimately, the, the impact we're making is on the, the end result, which is saving energy in homes. So to give you a little bit of a flavor of that, uh, our waste checker uh, service, which detects uh, inefficient uh, appliances, we've detected over 87 million inefficient appliance cycles from the washing machine, dishwasher, and dryer. Uh, as well as a, a huge amount of waste identified and, and targeted. Uh, another product of ours the, called Thermostat Program Advice, just in the last eight weeks, has identified a huge amount of, of gas being in, used in homes when there was no activity detected. These users were automatically alerted and are able to modify their heating program to better match their, their habits of, of behavior. So overall, we're very happy to be step-by-step step, uh, enabling this transition to a sustainable energy system. So we hope you've um, enjoyed a little bit of the, the, the run-through we've given you today. Uh, Ernie and I will also be giving a, a talk at the, the Spark and AI Summit that will be taking place towards the end of June this year, where we'll be covering uh, in more detail some of these topics, as well as, well as touching upon how we've been using uh, a Delta Lake uh, within our in our setup. So we hope um, if you've enjoyed this talk, you will uh, join us again then and uh, learn more. Thank you very much.